six months, sorry, but pandemic school year teaching was crazy. I am going to read chapter eight from The Care and Feeding of a Pet Black Hole by Michelle Cuevas. In chapter seven, if you haven't seen it, you can go back onto the channel and watch it. She talked about um, all the things that had been selected for the golden record and how she had decided to include her last conversation with her father. And um, uh, she had, so she had a recording of it and she shared it with Larry her pet black hole. Chapter eight is called My Very Good, Very Bad Black Hole. Hmm. And so that's why after all our bonding, I felt miserable when I yelled at Larry and he ran away and started eating the entire world. But I'm getting ahead of myself. First, there was the training. Once I figured out that Larry loved furry, fuzzy things, and started using new stew as a reward, the training went smoothly, or as smoothly as possible with an unpredictable black hole as my trainee. We'll begin by practicing sit, I explained. You've done it once, so it should be simple. Except it wasn't actually simple because Larry preferred to follow me around like a second shadow. So we moved on to other commands, and those went slightly better. He liked come, of course, and heal. Lie down took a lot of time, with me sprawled out on the ground like roadkill with Larry beside me. And roll over made us both laugh. At least I like to think that Larry laughed on the inside. Shake was never going to happen on account of Larry's lack of arms and legs, so we moved on to what I knew would be the hardest command of all, the dreaded stay. This, it seemed, was Larry's downfall, his destroyer and his defeat. He would get this very serious look in his eyes, something similar to a furrowed brow as if he'd had one, and he'd try to stay. But it was as if the entire world was against him, as if the universe was yelling, you are infinite time and space. You were born from the death of a massive star. Do not listen to the commands of this tiny earthling. And so Larry would stay for about 10 seconds and then the planetary forces would align and compel him across the room to eat a deck of playing cards or an eraser shaped like a hamburger or just to stand unnervingly close to me for no reason at all. Which was disappointing because stay was really the only command I truly needed Larry to learn. Stay was, for example, what I needed to say when Larry ate my favorite photo of you, but I didn't ask him to stay. Instead, I yelled loudly. How could you, I screamed. That was a photo of my dad. I can't replace it. He's gone and now is the picture and it's all your fault. Larry shrank back against the wall and tried to make himself very tiny. You're the worst, I shouted. I wish you were gone. I wish you would just disappear. My anger shook the room and practically the whole house. Larry couldn't take it. And before I knew what had happened, he had slipped by me and out the door. Good, go, I yelled. I sat down on the bed with my head in my hands. The photo. It was the one of you holding the telescope that I had picked out for your birthday. I had agonized over that decision for months. I had looked at every magazine a hundred times and had gone back to the store over and over. I snapped the photo the moment you finished unwrapping and saw the surprise inside. Wait, I said now, suddenly realizing what I had done. Oh, no, 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 no. I ran out of the room, down the stairs, and tore through the kitchen 
and pantry. Larry, I yelled. I sprinted into the bathroom, the bedroom, and the basement. I checked every closet and under every piece of furniture. I even looked in the washing machine and the toilet. But once I saw the open window in the living room, I knew there was a half-trained black hole on the loose in my neighborhood. That's the end of chapter not chapter eight. So we're gonna go on to chapter nine, which is called The Black Hole Who Ran Away. But how do you find a missing frightened black hole? I put on my deer stalker hat, the one you bought me during my Sherlock Holmes phase and tried to think. If I were a black hole, where would I go? I asked myself. If I were a black hole, I would go to a waterfall and sit under it and drink all the water until I became a portable pool. And then I'd go to the zoo and I'd save all the whales and penguins and dolphins. Do you mind? I said to Cosmo, who was lingering in the doorway. This is a private conversation between me and myself. I wouldn't say the sea lions, though, he added. I find them to be very judgmental. Cosmo then came into the room uninvited and handed me a pipe. It was shaped like the one Sherlock Holmes would use, except it was bright purple and able to blow bubbles. It helps me think, explained Cosmo. Go ahead. I shrugged, lifted the pipe, and sighed my frustration into it. Several bu bubbles floated up across the room and out the window. As they did, a siren started blaring in the distance. Smoke detector, said Cosmo, pointing to the pipe. No, I said, getting up and running to the front door. It's a police siren, and I'm pretty sure that I know why. I followed the noise down the street with Cosmo behind me, even though I told him to scram. We hid in the bushes to eavesdrop on a police officer. He was standing outside Mrs. Nimbus's house. She was in her robe, her curlers bopping around her head like tiny pink thoughts, des trying desperately to escape. My gnomes, she sh was shouting. Someone has stolen my garden gnomes. And um, how many of these gnomes were stolen, asked the officer. 147, Mrs. Nimbus said. The officer wrote this down. And the function and value of these gnomes? Spiritual, shouted Mrs. Nimbus. Metaphysical, priceless. Okay, well, I have the report and we'll start questioning the neighbors. The officer turned to leave, but Mrs. Nimbus grabbed his arm. Wait, she shouted. I haven't given you all their names. Of the neighbors, asked the officer. No, said Mrs. Nimbus. Of the 147 gnomes. There's Bimfy, she started, and Daff Doodle, Fudgewick, Loop Glen, Zoomwinkle, Nickelbells, Pimper. We left long before she finished. Mrs. Nimbus was a widow now, but she and her husband had bought all the gnomes back when they had traveled together. She told everyone in the neighborhood about them if they got close enough to listen. Nobody wanted to get stuck talking to Mrs. Nimbus. Cosmo and I moved down the street. This made me think about my newfound superpower. I guess I forgot to tell you about that. It started when you got sick. And then after you were gone, there it was, full power. It was as if I had been given infrared night vision goggles. You see, it turns out there's this whole other parallel universe right here in this one. And I couldn't see it before, but now I could. What I mean is, I could see that Mrs. Nimbus wasn't just crazy but that she was sad. She told her gnome stories because she missed her husband. I had heard her stories about a million times and I used to hate these boring stories, but now I can't explain it, 
Now they reminded me of me and how I felt about our memories. Before, I couldn't see her, but now I could. Get what I mean? Total superpower. Keep your eyes peeled, I told Cosmo as we walked the neighborhood for anything unusual, anything out of the ordinary, anything that would make you say, wowie zowie, look at that, shouted Cosmo. Exactly, I said. He tugged at my arm and pointed. At every house down the street, the mailboxes had been stolen from their posts. There were also missing yard games, toys, and hibachi grills. Our neighbors were standing on their lawns in a tizzy, and nobody seemed to have seen anything at all. The aliens have come, said an alarmed man to his neighbor, and they want our hibachi grills. Look, I said, pointing to the ground where his grill had gone missing. There was a distinct trail of cat prints leading away through the bushes. I exactly as I suspected, Cosmo said. The thief is a cat. I considered explaining my thought process to Cosmo that the thief was actually following a cat because he liked to eat furry animals, but I decided against it. Cosmo, could you do me a favor? Could you go home and get some milk, said Cosmo. Milk, I asked, worried about the answer. To lure the cat thief, said Cosmo. Of course, I said. Uh, great idea. I'm on it, said Cosmo. He set off toward home with a giant grin, singing a song about catching a cat. Such a weirdo. Though who was I to talk? I was following cat tracks to find a black hole. I heard more sirens in the distance, people yelling, babies crying. The world, it seemed, was coming to an end and it was all my fault. That's the end of chapter nine. I'll see you soon, my loves.